which is uh, Dr. Hawkins. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. All right. So, uh, can everyone see the, let me put into presentation mode. Can everyone see this? Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, so my talk is titled Sodium Flux and Hemodialysis. This was actually the recommended background when I typed in this title from, from uh, PowerPoint, they recommended this background, which I thought did a good job of capturing sort of the chaos of a dialysis treatment. Um, I, I don't have this on every slide. I feel like that might get a little bit distracting. So the rest of the slides are gonna be more, more standard background. Um, so this, you know, sometimes I like to choose talks that I, I know nothing about, and I think that certainly captures with, with this talk, um, sodium and dialysis. Um, so I, I'm gonna break this uh, topic into, uh, a, a, or a number of sections in here. You know, first I wanna go through the history of dialysate sodium prescribing practices over time. Um, I'm gonna go into, this is more of a mechanistic talk uh, where I'm gonna go into the methods of sodium measurements and also, you know, how that applies to an effective sodium gradient during hemodialysis, um, and then also adding in the effect of ultrafiltration. And, um, and so um, it is definitely a much less clinically relevant than Eric's uh, wonderful talk. Uh, most of the papers I'm referencing with mine are like from the 80s, 90s. There, there's not a lot of uh, recent research in this field. It's a very poorly studied uh, uh, field overall. So that's just a little disclaimer that um, that I am certainly not an expert, and this is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of old data here. So I'm going to open with a case that the case that sort of got me thinking about all of this. Um, we had a 52 year old male at Harborview uh, with e with ESRD. He was actually just presenting for routine resection of an ear mass. Uh, Pre-op labs showed a sodium of 116. Uh, this wasn't really picked up on before. The patient proceeded to the operation, so um, so they, they went through the with the procedure, and then they checked a um, a post-op sodium to make sure that that was a real finding, and it was. Um, the, when we saw the patient, he was asymptomatic apart from the the ear pain. Um, he couldn't go to the floor with the sodium of 116, so he was admitted to the ICU uh, for a cautious hemodialysis session. Turns out when you look at his outpatient labs, the, the sodium was 116 on the, the Northwest Kidney Center labs from five days prior to this presentation. So at this point, we are dealing with a very chronic, severe hyponatremia. The sodium before the 116 was a 120. So this is not this is nothing new for this patient. Um, but regardless, we decided that the safest approach was gonna be a very cautious dialysis session. So we did a two hour session using slow flows a dialysate sodium of 130, um, two liters ultrafiltration. He was about five liters up on presentation. And we measured the sodium pre one hour in and a post uh, measurement, uh, just to ensure we're not uh, rapidly shifting anything. It's worth noting that this patient had been at all of his outpatient runs had been going at like full flows, four hours, without any consideration for, you know, not trying to specifically target less sodium change. And it had kept his sodium, I mean, it was 116 five days earlier and he had been dialyzed several times um, in, the, in the meantime. So his pre was 116. At one hour, um, he said it had an expected rise of sodium of 120. And then at two hours, it was 120. And this case really highlighted to me that uh, just in my experience, my, my limited experience with, uh, it, you know, two years of fellowship and some experience in residency, sodium doesn't always act predictably. Um, I can generally predict better what's going to happen with a patient's potassium uh, or phosphorus than the sodium. Sometimes it's a minimal change from, from pre-treatment to post-treatment. Sometimes there's a more dramatic change. So it got me thinking about what are the what, what are the effects specifically with sodium during dialysis that may lead to some of this unpredictability, <clears throat> and that leads me to well first I want to go into a a um, uh, just a section on 
how is sodium actually measured? Because it is relevant to, um, to this dialysis sodium gradient. Just looking at the, oh, sorry, uh, history first. So back in the 50s and 60s, actually filters could not tolerate negative pressure. You couldn't apply any ultrafiltration pressure uh, to the filters. And so sodium clearance was entirely diffusive uh, the standard sodium bath at this time was about 126, although there were some using even lower than that, 120. Um, and it actually had, it mimics peritoneal dialysis in some ways. There is a high glucose load in the dialysate, which was designed to, um, to pull more fluid off, more ultrafiltration from an osmotic gradient. Um, However, when you don't have ultrafiltration, this required very long treatment time. So in the early days of dialysis, eight to 24 hours uh, for a dialysis session in order to adequately manage volume. Moving into the later uh, developments. So in the 70s, dialysis filters improve. This allows you to actually start applying ultrafiltration, which allows you to shorten treatment time uh, in order to manage uh, a patient's volume status. You no longer needed the dialysate sodium to be so low. You're not relying on that, um, on that diffusive gradient of sodium. And so you're able to achieve shorter times of dialysis. However, what this, the, the effect of this is that you get uh, a more rapid osmotic shift during dialysis, which is going to lead to more dialysis disequilibrium. And not just a formal you know, dialysis disequilibrium, but just symptoms with dialysis in general are much more common as you shorten treatment times in the 70s. So moving into the 80s, um, you see this gradual trend upward in the average sodium dialysate. Uh, and so at this point, you've reached sort of an average of 130 to 135. However, patients are still not enjoying dialysis. You know, the, the estimates vary, but something like 30 to 50 percent of dialysis treatments are associated with significant symptoms that their patients are reporting a lot of nausea, cramping, um, that sort of thing. And so really, it's, it's really these symptoms that drove the change in the 90s, which, is, uh, which was widespread adoption of high sodium dialysate, at least relative to what we were using before. And so 140 became the sort of the industry standard. That's uh, more than half of dialysis, uh, dialysis units just use 140 uh, across the board, unless there's something that prompts, you know, change of that, but the sort of the standard prescription is 140. So, um, so that's where we're at in terms of how we prescribe um, uh, sodium dialysate. Going into the sodium, the actual way that sodium is measured and how that relates to your, your uh, sodium gradient during dialysis. So this is the, the earlier method of, of uh, uh, measurement. This is flame photometry. Essentially, you take uh, uh, the patient's plasma, you spin down the, the blood, take the plasma, you vaporize the plasma, and then you know, the, all of the ions in the plasma are going to absorb energy and release energy at a particular wavelength. So you filter the light by the wavelength that you're targeting, in this case, what the sodium ions are, are releasing. And so the intensity of light uh, generated from the sample is proportional to the concentration of sodium ions uh, in the plasma. This as I mentioned, this is an older method. Uh, this is actually not used in labs anymore, um, except for like some specialized labs, but routine uh, lab measurement of sodium uses ion selective electrode. And that is true for a UW lab and most medical laboratories. The way this works is um, you can think of it kind of like if you remember in chemistry where you, where you have a pH meter, you basically calibrate this pH meter to a variety of substances of known concentrations. You have a reference solution, and then you're measuring the potential difference between your sample and those, those reference solutions to determine uh, the activity of ion in the solution that you're measuring. And I do specifically uh, use the word ion activity because actually you're not specifically measuring a concentration here. You're measuring the activity of ions. So things that lead to, you know, when the ions are sort of, there, there's more interaction where there's um, uh, interaction between sodium ions and chloride ions, that's actually going to reduce the ion activity. So there's two ways to measure um, uh, the ion selective electrode. There's a direct measurement and an indirect. 
the direct is using plasma, just straight plasma, whereas the indirect, you dilute the plasma. And what you do with the dilution is those ion interactions that I mentioned, when you dilute it, uh, you're sort of accounting for, or you're, you're, uh, you have less ionic interactions with a diluted sample of plasma. And so you get sort of a cleaner measurement um, without, those, the, uh, without as much ion to ion interaction. However, when you think about it, the direct measure really is the more physiologic uh, because that's, that's using ions at the concentration that they are in the body. And so you really do have these ion to ion interactions that are happening you know, inside the, the, the body. So for the purposes of this talk, sort of the direct um, ion selective electrode is gonna be the best um, in vivo measurement of sodium ion activity. Uh, so to visualize this, or, or um, you know, first I'm gonna present a table here, which is gonna give you the measurements based on these three different methods. So flame photometry, indirect and direct measurement. So when you compare the flame photometry to the indirect selective electrode, the reason the number is, uh, is 150 instead of 140 is that sodium ions are only active in the solution that they're dissolved in. In this case, that is the plasma water. About 93% of plasma is water, but then there's 7% that consists of protein and lipid. And so really when you're measuring the ion activity, you're only considering that ion, uh, the, the, the water portion of plasma. So you basically, um, if you're gonna do this calculation, you would just say 140 divided by the uh, percentage of water in the plasma and you get 150. And so what's actually done is you adjust the ion activity to give a concentration in order to keep the, you wanna keep the measurements consistent. You don't want a different number between flame photometry and the, the selective electrode. And so this, this, uh, this number is adjusted to give a, a plasma concentration. Now, looking at the last column, the direct, uh, the, the direct measurement is going to really be what determines your effective gradient for, uh, for diffusion in dialysis. Conceptually, I think of this like total, I total calcium versus ionized calcium. You know, you're really only looking at the free floating uh, this ionized calcium portion uh, when you're looking at a dialysis uh, solution, right? We're looking at the ionized calcium versus the calcium in the dialysate. It's a similar concept here, except for in this case, the, the effect of magnitude is much less. You know, it's 150 here versus 143 um, when you account for those ion interactions and the actual sodium activity. So um, just so that everybody's on the same page, I wanna visualize this in a different way. So you take whole blood and you spin it down, you have 55% of it is plasma. The first measurement to just look at the concentration of sodium here, you're gonna see 140 milliequivalents per liter of plasma. For example, what you would measure with a flame photometry. When you're doing the direct, um, when you're doing a direct ion uh, selective electrode measurement, you're gonna get 143. You're, you're only taking the water portion of plasma, uh, you're only measuring sodium in the water portion of plasma, and but, but there are still ion to ion interactions. Sodium's ion, interacting with chloride and bicarbonate and albumin. Um, and so uh, then you will do a dilution to that and you'll get 7.5 milliequivalents per liter of diluted plasma water, which you then multiply by 20 to get the indirect. Um, measurement. So then you'll, you will end up with that 150 milliequivalents per liter of plasma water. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, next, I'm going to apply that to a dialysis, uh, to a dialysis setup. So again, um, in the top left, the, the lab measurement here would be the constant would report a concentration of 140 and 140. What we've seen is that using the direct, uh, the direct um, Ion selective electrode will give you the sodium ion activity in plasma. And so what that's really going to give you is a diffusion gradient of plasma toward dialysate. Um, and then, you know, in this setup, 
the water is going to passively follow with, uh, with solute clearance in dialysis. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, there's more to talk about. There's another effect uh, that, that plays a role here um, that's going to change these numbers somewhat. And, uh, and so, yeah, the diffusion gradient here would lead to net sodium removal. Over, I'm going to talk about next about the Gibbs Donan effect. So this is the effect um, that albumin has in, uh, in plasma. Albumin is a uh, charged substance that cannot cross the dialysis membrane. However, and so there's a difference in the albumin concentration between plasma and there's no albumin in the dialysate. So the presence of a non-dialyzable uh, substance on the, on the plasma side exerts this additional effect that uh, uh, to discuss. So here you have uh, a, a dialysis, um, an individual unit of, of a dialysis filter. You're going to have blood flowing through here. You apply a negative pressure. And here's all of your albumin molecules. As they're coming through here, the negative pressure that you're applying is going to sort of cause a layer of albumin to form along the uh, inner surface of the uh, of the dialyzer membrane. So applying this to our earlier example, what we have is uh, the same setup. You know, you've applied a negative pressure, and what you get is this nice layer of albumin. So in in this case, you've applied a negative pressure, so water is going to be pulled through the membrane and water is going to be able to pass freely. However, because you have this, this uh, ion-rich, uh, uh, basically this layer of, of ion-rich albumin, the sodium movement is actually impaired somewhat. You get this sort of sieving effect where the sodium cannot pass as easily as the water. So the interaction with the albumin layer impedes the movement of sodium and other, uh, and other ions as well. And what this effect does is it creates a lower effective sodium activity on the plasma side because the sodium cannot pass as easily. Um, and so you take your, the earlier concentrations of, of 143 and 135, and this is where it gets a little bit tough because most of this effect is, the, the magnitude of this effect is sort of um, estimated through modeling. There's not a lot of experimental data uh, to support uh, or, or to uh, back up the, the magnitude of this effect. So on the, on the lower end, it may be as little as a, about a two milliequivalent difference, uh, whereas on the higher end, it could actually completely normalize the, the concentrations here where you are effectively dialyzing a 135 versus a uh, 135. So it's, and like I said, there's not a lot of data to, to, to guide uh, most of the studies that these are based on. It, it's sort of a theoretical modeling. There's a lot of modeling that happens with the donut effect, like, like in a beaker setup where you have a semi-permeable membrane in a beaker. Um, uh, but this, this effect gets much harder to dial or to, uh, to quantify in a real life setup. So putting these effects together, you know, sodium ion activity in plasma is higher than the measured concentration, for example, the concentration with flame photometry. Direct um, ion selective electrode measurement is the best approximation of in vivo ion activity. Labs aren't reporting that measurement specifically. The Gibbs Donan effect would effectively lower the plasma sodium activity relative to dialysate sodium. However, this magnitude of effect is difficult to quantify. So, do these effects sort of cancel out, making the lab reported concentration gradient like what you would get with flame photometry? Is that concentration close enough to the true diffusion gradient? Probably. Probably that's it's close enough. Um, it, it may help to explain some of the variability that you would see uh, where, where the sodium doesn't always act as predictably, depending on the magnitude of the various effects uh, involved, you know, that may explain some of this heterogeneity um, in terms of how a serum sodium responds to dialysis. But in practice, most papers that are from the last 20 years don't even mention these effects at all. So it's, they just consider the 
purely the lab reported concentration difference in in uh, in determining like calculating the diffusion gradient. So, but that does. Um, I'm going to go back to the, the to this uh, dialysis membrane setup to sort of see how ultrafiltration might fit into this. So, what we've effectively created here, um, you know, if you're familiar with dialysis water treatment, you have here a semi-permeable membrane. You have a um, you have it. There's a charge component to it. There's an ionic barrier, and then you've applied a ne negative pressure. So what this kind of looks like is uh, a reverse osmosis filter setup. You know that that's this in the same way you're generating pure water by applying a negative pressure with a uh, with a semi permeable membrane um, that that has a that basically rejects uh, ions passing through. So is that the case here that you're actually you know generating free water with the negative pressure applied? With uh, you know, with ultrafiltration, are you actually you know, are you clearing free water in the effluent that could contribute to a change in plasma sodium level? Because you know, and the reason um, I question this is that ultrafiltration alone, um, at least the the teaching is always that like ultrafiltration alone can lead to improvement in a in serum sodium level. Never really made sense conceptually to me if you're just clearing. Um, the same thing that's present in the extracellular volume, just you're, you're just clearing plasma, essentially. Why would the serum sodium improve? You know, is there any effect of, of loss of free water with ultrafiltration that actually, uh, that actually leads to improved uh, plasma sodium level with ultrafiltration? The data here is very sparse. Um, you know, like many papers have mentioned this effect of creating creation of an uh, of a hypotonic effluent. Many papers mention this effect, but when you actually follow the the trail of references to to figure out what the what that statement is based on, um, really the best study I can find was a study from 1984. They looked at 30 ultrafiltration only treatments, and they did something weird where they were comparing like a ultrafiltration run to this in vitro study. Um, they, they did not make the details clear, but basically they were modifying the blood. They added saline and other things to the blood and they modified it in such a way that it wasn't, they, they were trying to make it so it didn't act like regular blood in their setup. It, but it's, you know, it's confusing um, to say the least because they, they you know, it uh, is a paper from the eighties. They, they don't really clearly describe what was going on in the methods. So, but this was the, the result of their study. So the, the, you're, you're looking at sodium at the inlet, they measured sodium at the outlet, and then they measured sodium in the ultrafiltrate. So what you see here is that um, comparing the inlet to the outlet, they're about the same, um, just maybe a little bit higher at the outlet than at the inlet, but the sodium in the ultrafiltrate was actually significantly lower um, by about eight milliequivalents per liter. And so in this study, at least, they were generating a hypotonic effluent, although the, it's not that hypotonic. You're not really clearing that much uh, water in, in this, uh, under this experimental setup. And you can see with the in vitro study where they modified the blood to, to not be as blood-like, they, they added saline and other things. Um, you can see that there was still a drop in the ultrafiltrate, but not as dramatic of an effect. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's possible that this is contributing. Um, I, there's another paper that I was going to present that's a little bit more recent, um, and this is actually, it was in a, the heart failure literature, looking at ultrafiltration specifically as a treatment of uh, volume overload and to, to, you know, offload the, the heart. Um, and so this study was looking at uh, the effect on serum sodium when you compare uh, pharmacologic therapy diuretics with ultrafiltration. What they actually saw was that the hyponatremia was significantly worsened with the ultrafiltration. You know, it, it makes sense to me physiologically. These are patients still with working kidneys. So ultrafiltration would be activating the RAS system and ADH leading to uh, free water retention. 
Um, and so, it, you know, that makes sense to me conceptually, whereas with the pharmacologic therapy, you're sort of washing out the, the medullary gradient, you're not able to uh, concentrate the urine. Um, and the reason I include this study is just to show that even if this effect of generating free water with ultrafiltration is present, at least in this study, it was not enough to prevent the development of hyponatremia during ultrafiltration. So, you know, it's possible that the serum sodium would have declined even more dramatically without this effect, but overall it wasn't enough to prevent hyponatremia. So conclusions from all this. <laughs> the main takeaway that I have is that dialysis is, is compl complicated. It's a lot more complicated than we sort of give it credit for or that we really think about with routine dialysis sodium prescribing. You know, the, the current practice is really evolved out of necessity. I, I didn't get into all of the clinical uh, manifestations of, of using, you know, higher sodium dialysate, but, but essentially it was a necessity to alleviate the symptoms of dialysis in shorter treatment time. So we don't really prescribe sodium uh, in the dialysate uh, to to uh, cause an effect uh, to um, specifically target a, a sodium gradient. It's more to prevent symptoms of dialysis. Um, many of the factors I've discussed today are very small magnitude. And so they're contributing, but it sort of um, doesn't have overall a huge effect. Um, and so, you know, nothing here that would really significantly change my dialysate sodium prescribing. But, you know, it maybe it explains some of the variability. Like in my initial case, we went from 116 to 120 and then sort of stayed at 120 for that second hour of dialysis. You know, maybe some of this heterogeneity in, in uh, dialysis, uh, in, in responses uh, of serum sodium to dialysis, maybe some of these effects are sort of playing a, a, a role in that. So that's my main takeaway. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for tackling a, another challenging uh, topic. Questions for Alex? I have one while people are gathering their thoughts. So, um, you know, one of the things that comes up clinically in, say, this hyponatremic dialysis patient that you presented, given that it's likely that such a patient three times a week would experience rapid changes in the serum sodium. Do we know if dialysis patients who experience such a phenomenon are somehow protected from the effects of osmotic demyelination syndrome, for example? You know, I think it comes up a lot about how concerned we should be about something like that. Yeah, um, th that's a great question. There's, there's honestly not a lot of, uh, of, of studies that I could find that specifically address that. It, it is thought that the you know that the frequency of how much you're experiencing these osmotic shifts should be protective. Um, because we really don't see, that being said, there are definitely cases of osmotic demyelination syndrome developing even in dialysis patients. However, it, the, these are mostly limited to case reports. It's certainly not a common phenomenon. And the, the, the case report was like a really dramatic change, you know, a, a change in serum sodium of like, of like 16 or 20 for the dialysis session. So we should definitely be trying to not do that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's probably not as, you know, for a change of about, uh, uh, if, if you change, for example, 10 instead of the four to six, uh, it, it's probably not uh, detrimental to, to health. As you mentioned, this this guy was asymptomatic and he was doing this three times a week where his sodium was, was changing like that. Um, how did you ultimately manage this patient with the sodium 116 is the final question from Leah. Yeah, um, water restriction. The, a lot of the, uh, the, the thought is that he was probably not restricting his, his uh, water intake and sodium at home. Um, but it was, so, you know, he responded to 120 from the first session and then looking at all of his, we were basically just trying to do dialysis to keep him, we weren't trying to normalize his serum sodium, but just trying to keep him, you know, in the 120s. Um, and he, he was able to achieve that. So a combination of restricting his fluid and salt intake and then just doing regular dialysis sessions and closely monitoring the sodium for, for um, how he was actually responding to dialysis treatments. So, you know, last I checked, he was, he was, 
he's been, still been bouncing around everywhere between 120 to 130. Um, that, that brings up another concept that uh, it really is patient to, to patient. Um, everybody has sort of a, a uh, preferred serum sodium. What they've found in, in many studies is that regardless of changing the, your, your sodium dialysate practices, patients are going to sort of uh, get themselves back to what they prefer as their serum sodium, which can be really anywhere from uh, 130 to 140 in a typical dialysis patient. But regardless of what uh, uh, sodium that you, you dialyze them against, they tend to, uh, for example, if you remove sodium with dialysis, they're going to uh, increase their fluid and salt intake to, to make up for the, so the extra sodium that you remove. So there's sort of a, a, a baseline sodium for each patient that they, they don't tend to deviate very much from. Thanks so much, Alex.